Hello and welcome to episode 31 of the chess.com rapid rating climb series. For those of you who are subscribed to the channel already, we are closing into the end of the series if I can keep performing well, because remember 2000 ELO is the goal. For those of you new to the channel, let me just play my first move so I don't abort the game real quick. For those of you new to the channel, my name is Alex and in this series I basically just play rapid games aiming to go to 2000 ELO on my chess.com account. I talk you through my thought process while we play and then in the post game analysis I get a chance to flesh out the ideas that I was on about a bit easier with the computer analysis to help me and also being able to actually play the moves out on the board rather than just drawing a bunch of arrows or saying a bunch of notations and expecting you guys to be able to follow along with it. So, my opponent goes e4, d4, we go c6, so of course we're going into a Karo Khan defense. One of the best openings in the world, in my opinion. Not objectively the best, but so, so easy to play. And we've had a lot of different variations in this um, rating climb series, which by the way, if this is your first time, check the playlist below for the older episodes if you want to watch it from the start, but of course you can just watch this in isolation. And my opponent pushes e5. So the point of this is just to take more space, right? He takes the f6 square, which is the typical development square for my knight. There's quite a few different ways you can play this as black. The classical sort of line is bishop f5 and then go e6. So you secure your center like triangle, but you get your bishop out of the pawn chain first, which is like the difference between a French defense and a Karo Khan, even though they share a lot of the same features. E5 takes space, but it is kind of a weakening move because we can go C5 immediately. And you might be questioning the fact that we literally just played C6 and now we're going C5 straight away. And this is a sacrifice for pawn. Technically, we can win it back immediately with Queen to A5 check and picking up the pawn. But the goal isn't to win the pawn back immediately, because these pawns are split and they're difficult to defend. So we start with knight to c6, which attacks this pawn. And remember, because this pawn was previously defended by the pawn on d4, which we've now forced away. Knight to f3, we're going to play bishop to g4. Again, we put pressure on the knight. The knight is defending e5, so we're trying to remove the defender so we can take it. You do have to be careful, though. Because there are a lot of lines. Let me actually grab my notepad. I literally said before the start of this, um, like before the start of the recording to myself, oh, I won't need the notepad. I'll just remember everything. I'm not going to remember it. Um, let me just put move five. Um, light square diagonal weak. So there's often ideas. Um, of like white sacrificing the queen um, and like playing something like knight takes e5, knight takes e5, bishop takes d1 and then queen to b5 check and basically the point is to take advantage of the fact that the king has no moves and then you often have to sacrifice the queen back and it's just good for white. But my opponent goes bishop b5 so we don't have to worry about that. Here I'm going to play e6. So my point is, I get the bishop out of the pawn chain. The bishop is putting pressure on the knight, which is defending his center. And now, now that I've got the bishop out, I'm going to play e6 to open up my bishop. Also to support my center, so my queen can now move, because she doesn't have to defend d5 herself. And, uh, what, what was the other reason? Oh, there's no real shenanigans on this diagonal anymore because my king always has the e7 square, just in case. So my opponent goes h3. And you could retreat and go g4, bishop g6. But that's not normally how you play this opening. You're supposed to take. That's really the idea. And <clears throat> you claim, because you've put all your pawns on light squares, that you don't mind trading your light square bishop off, because you already have such good control of the light squares, right? And now I'm going to take on c5 with the bishop. So it's equal material. We have equal material now. I win the pawn back. Yeah, it didn't. we didn't get it back immediately, but that doesn't matter. We've won it back. We still have pressure on his center. The knight is pinned, so we can't currently like actually make use of that. But we're going to go knight 
g to e7, defending our knight, just in case. Because if he takes, I'd rather take with the knight to keep pressure in the center rather than taking with the pawn. Typically, that's how you like to do it. Now we castle. Now we are threatening to take on e5. We do also have ideas of knight d4, forking a bunch of stuff. This knight is likely to come to the f5 square. Not necessarily, but it could do. The knight could also go to g6 to put further pressure on e5. We could play queen to c7 to put pressure on e5. And it's very difficult for white to play the natural f4, not only because the queen is in the way right now, but because the pawn is pinned to the king in a lot of these scenarios. I don't think white has properly played this position. And I'm very tempted to go knight to d4, attacking the queen, the bishop, and the pawn. Although he could play a move like queen to d3, defending everything. Then we have maybe queen to b6, attacking the bishop, and also preparing to attack f2 once the knight moves. Bishop e3. Okay, let me calculate this. Knight d4, queen d3, bishop d6, bishop e3. I don't think this works because the bishop just hangs. Otherwise, we'd be getting forked and that wouldn't be good. So bishop e3. Knight takes b5. Bishop takes c5. Yeah, no, I don't think that's great. So we could just play the natural knight to g6, attacking the pawn. But I don't want to have to take back with the pawn here. We could also play queen to c7, just pressuring this. Bishop f4. Hmm. This knight d4 move looks like it is what I should be playing. But I don't know if I really want this bishop to be honest. Because what's it even doing, other than just putting pressure on my knight? I'm not sure I even want it. Hmm. It's an interesting position. We could go like a6 and try and secure this trade, but if we go a6, there's a good chance... Yeah, there is a good chance he goes bishop d3, actually. And I don't like his bishop on this diagonal. So we're actually going to go knight d4. That's, yeah, that's my deal breaker. Is if I give him a chance, he might just retreat the bishop to d3. And have a lot of pressure on our h7 pawn. And the h7 pawn is often a weak pawn when there's a pawn on e5. Because typically a knight comes to f6 and defends h7 from the, h, from the f6 square. But with a pawn on e5, we can't really do that. And therefore, h7 is often weak. Now, if we had our light squared bishop still on the board, in some Cairo Khan lines, well, a lot of them, when the bishop comes to f5 early on and often drops back into g6, or like h6 is played and the bishop drops back to h7, you don't have that problem so much, because if white ever tries to contest this file, you just trade. But because we traded our bishop off early, I don't want to give white a monopoly over this diagonal. So that is my reasoning for knight to d4. Hope that makes sense. And by the way, uh, as, of as of the time of recording this video, I'm on like 960 subs, which firstly is insane. Like, I did not expect that to happen in the time period that it has. And so if you're subscribed already, then thank you so much, like honestly, because it's making, like, I really enjoy recording these videos, but it does take a while to like, you know, make the thumbnails, do all the uh, video description, etc., the recording. I stopped editing uh, because one, I figured like it's chess. It doesn't really need to be edited. And two, it was taking up a lot of time. Um, people tend to prefer these long form videos anyway, so I don't see the point. Um, what was I saying? Oh yeah, so the fact that I'm nearly at a thousand subs 
uh, means that I can start to justify spending a bit more time on the channel because I'll actually be able to start generating a bit of money from it. Because that's how the monetization thing works. You have to get up to a thousand subs for YouTube to start paying you properly. So that'll be pretty cool. And if you're, you know, not subscribed, but you've already seen a few of my videos, or if this is your first one and you're like, this is pretty cool, but why is he on about monetization? I came here for chess. Then I'll shut up, but you should, you should subscribe. Anyway, 94, our opponent hasn't moved yet. I've got a feeling he kind of missed this move. He's played this opening kind of strangely. Like, not necessarily badly. This is all normal. But typically here... Typically here, you see moves like bishop to e3 supporting the c5 pawn. That's what normally gets played. Uh, but... Yeah, h3, I'm probably going to take the knight anyway, so just giving me a tempo and asking me to take it kind of helps me. Whoa, queen h5 is an interesting move. That... Okay, okay, so his point... His point is, if I take on c2 trying to fork the rooks then he's going to play bishop to d3 and his idea is that he's going to attack my knight and he's going to threaten checkmate on h7 like i said h7 is often weak so we could just take the bishop and then knight takes and then go a6 the knight can't come in because we take 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 and we win a pawn so we can take the bishop knight takes a6 force the knight back to c3 and we've got a nice position what if this does work? So if knight c2, bishop d3, we can play g6, which attacks the queen, and blocks off the bishop's scope on h7, so it's no longer mate. We still have to calculate, though, because after queen 2 h6, knight takes e1, he could be trying to play moves like bishop g5, bishop f6, and mate us on g7. That's something we have to watch out for. However, however, if we calculate this properly, knight c2, bishop d3, g6, queen h6. Of course, the queen doesn't have to go to h6, but I don't see what the point is otherwise. Queen h6, knight e1. We're also attacking this bishop from e1, remember. Bishop g5. Can we do anything? Well, what we can do is we can play a move like queen to d7. Because if he goes bishop to f6, we can play knight to f5, and that attacks the queen and defends the g7 pawn. Don't worry, I'll go over this in the post-game analysis. This is what I was saying earlier, like, I can draw all these arrows and say all these squares, but this is very complicated, and there's a good chance you're struggling to follow along. If you are, then fair enough. Um, <laughs> Congrats. But I feel like this works. There's also no worries of him trying to lift a rook over because we control e3 and we control e4. So I don't see what... I, I'm sure this was his idea, but g6... So we've established queen h6 doesn't work. I don't see any other useful square for the queen to go to, though. If the queen just comes back to d1, of course we just take the rook. And we're up an exchange and a pawn. I don't think I've missed anything. Knight c2. His, his only idea is bishop d3. That's, that's, the, that's the only thing he can do. Unless, I don't know, bishop g5? But then we just take the rook. We take the a rook in this case, because I want to force the e rook over to a1 so it's less active. And then, what? We just go h6. Or we go g6. Maybe it's a little bit unpleasant, but white has no threats. Let me just check. You've got to be careful. Knight c2. There's no uh, problems of like the queen taking first because he's just winning a knight back. Knight c2. Bishop d3. g6. Queen h6. Knight e1. Bishop g5. Um, I 
Queen d7, bishop f6, knight f5. Let's do it. Let's do it. If I've miscalculated, then I've miscalculated, but I don't think I have. Okay, now if we take on d3, then this. Oh, wait, we can just play knight f5 anyway. Yeah, like it hangs a queen, but his queen is under attack. And we take the bishop so the bishop can't take on f5. Oh, wait, that's what he missed. He is the interesting bishop f2, king f2, and knight takes on d3 with check. But of course, if we take, he can just decline it. So, knight d3, bishop f6, he might have missed knight f5 here and thought that our knight couldn't move, but it attacks his queen. Knight d3, bishop f6, we could throw in this move as well once the knight lands on d3, but that's the least of our concerns really. Because we're going to be up so much material anyway, as long as we just don't get mated then we're good. Of course, we play it now, then he takes, and then we're screwed. So we need to get rid of this bishop. Bishop f6, knight f5. If he plays a move like queen h4, then we just take on f2 and win the queen. So knight d3, right? So we're up a pawn, a knight, and a rook. <laughs> We're up nine points of material currently, and all we have to do is not get mated. I think he missed this move. Because, I mean, if we don't have knight to f5 here, then at the very, very least, he wins our queen, if not mate us. But knight f5 is a big move. Maybe he wants to do this? To stop knight f5? could play knight f2 there and queen f uh, bishop f6 fails to knight g4 discovered check winning the queen love to get like this to win the bishop but if we go knight e5 then bishop f6 immediately Okay, playing some good moves, he's playing some good moves. I'd like to make this configuration, but it doesn't work because then bishop f6 will come with check. So what if knight f2? Well, he needs to move his king, otherwise we get this discovered check. So knight f2, let's just say king g2. making our life difficult. We could play a move like f5 though. Like, I don't know if I actually want to take this because it just opens the f file for him. Could go f5. And if he plays this, we're just going to... Actually, no, because then the pawn gets there. Ah, but then we have queen f8 which offers a queen trade and defends g7 and attacks the pawn. f6 looks a bit more forcing though. f6 again, if bishop takes, 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 we could just play queen f8 and give up the knight because we're up so much material. We could consider bishop f2 with check. King up. But I don't know where we put our bishop after that. I am looking at like these ideas, but the problem is he just goes bishop to f6, and that's mate. So f6 looks very tempting, because I'm up so much material that I'm more than happy to give up an exchange and a piece to not get mated there, to not get mated. So f6, pawn takes. And then we lose the queen though after f2. f6 pawn takes. 
if we can go rook to f7, and if he takes here, then we can just take back. That looks nice. f6 forces a response. Again, knight f2 would be nice after this, but knight f2, king moves. Knight to um, e4 would be nice, attacking both these squares, but then he just takes, takes, bishop f6, and we have the same issue. So let's go f6. Let's do it. I'm getting low on time. Again, I think... Yeah, takes. Rook f7, defending g7. If he takes, then bishop takes. And we're defended. Looks scary, but we also have moves like queen f8 at the right moment to kick the queen out and put mad pressure on f2. Because if we if we can just stop ourselves from getting mated, then not only are we up a good amount of material, even if we've got a sack of knight, we're still up a whole rook. Um, but his king is also quite exposed. Because if this f pawn falls, the g and h pawns are massively advanced. He has no cover. This bishop could be a really nice attacking piece. We just need to try and get this rook into the game to um, prove our material advantage. Again, if bishop f6, take, take, queen f8, take, take, so we can't do that. Uh, bishop takes, rook takes, pawn takes, queen f8. If he trades and wins the knight, then we are up a piece. No. Yeah. We're at least up a piece. Okay, it's with a bishop. Yeah, so we should just take that. You could go bishop f... Sorry. You could go rook f7. To defend. To be fair, that is a move. could just go rook f7. We have this idea still. And we have threats on f2. Rook f7 just takes all the sting out of it. And we reserve the option to take whenever we want. His knight's not getting into the game. Because we cover the knight's entrances. The rook isn't getting into the game. Yeah, rook f7. We don't even have to take the bishop. Although you could... I think Rook F7 just does a good enough job. Why give him a ton of material back when we can just do this cleanly? He still has problems on F2. We're going to play Queen F8, given the opportunity to unpin the knight as well. Bring the knight to like C6, maybe. If we can win E5, then his bishop's going to be forced to move. And we're going to have some absolute cannons heading down the F-file. Ooh, that's... A yeah, see, I think his idea is this. But the problem for him is knight f2. And uh, we're lining this up, and we have this. And even if he moves the king, the h3 pawn no longer defends g4, so we just take anyway, and we just have a fork. And if this bishop dies, then his attack is over. Completely over. He's trying to go h5 to try and break apart our kingside pawn structure. And, I don't know, try and deliver some mating ideas like this. But even then, we can just play King F8. Here. We can maybe even run to the center and probably be safe. But this is very clinical. This is very clinical. Because if he tries to do any anything, bar move the king, we're going to take here with discover check. And if he does move the king, we're still going to take here. And give him a nice little fork. And we're going to take. Yeah, so he's still trying to go h5. But it doesn't work. h5, we just go queen f6. Offer him a queen trade. And we are up so much material. Our king is under absolutely no threat. A queen can't attack by herself. Especially when we have so many defensive pieces over here. Okay. 
and then he just hangs his queen. But it was game over anyway. Actually, this... Is this a quicker mate? I'm not trying to be fancy. Like, I could just take the queen, but this is just a quicker checkmate. Um... Because our knight controls g2 and g4. So no matter where the king goes, we can deliver, mate. Like so. Like so. That was a very nice game. The computer, like you just saw, just gave me zero inaccuracies, zero mistakes, and zero blunders. I don't know whether that's accurate or not, but this could be another incredibly high accuracy game. I've had one in the car row in a recent video in the uh, rating climbs so or be in the playlist where I got like 97% accuracy and then I have one in the Slav which is basically just me playing the Karo against d4 and c4 where I again had basically a perfect game let's get into the analysis and see if this is one of those because that would be kind of mad and it would prove just how easy the Karo is to play okay let me quickly switch you to this very ugly view just to show you my uh, score there mad Again, perfect game with a 2500 um, performance rating. Wow. I genuinely just think that shows the power of the Karo Khan. Like, I don't think I did anything that special that game. I just played logical moves and basically played a perfect game. So let's get into the analysis. We have e4, c6, d4, d5. Right, the Karo Khan. I think mostly... I've ten well, we have seen the fantasy variation, and I gave my recommendation of e6 in this line. Again, you can check that in a previous video on my channel. It's something like refuting the fantasy variation of the Karo Khan, something like that. I'd recommend you watch it, though, because the fantasy can be very difficult to deal with. Uh, you also have the move knight to c3, defending the center. You have knight to d2, defending the center. White can also take and play an exchange variation but he goes for e5 and like i said the main move is something like bishop f5 knight f3 e6 maybe bishop to d3 well maybe not in this position i don't play this line with white so i'm not that booked up on it All right, bishop e2 knight e7 castle h6 intend is drop the bishop back and bring the knight out and maybe play c5 at a later date. Because c5 is the main pawn break here for white. Sorry, for black. Or f6. But because he's put the knight on e7, which no longer supports f6, it's less likely to be f6. Unless you put a knight on d7 to support it, right? We go c5 straight away. And the point is that we just put a lot of pressure on the center. And it's very difficult to actually defend it. Something like knight f3 is met. I mean, you can take the pawn, but I just play knight c6, and I'm like, take me. Just take me. And a lot of people like to try and support the center, which is a completely viable way of playing something like this. Like, you can do this, but black gets a lot of pressure on the queen side, trying to attack the knight, maybe force the queen over here to get the queen away from the defense of the queen side. A lot of the time, you can force... Um, white to take with the f pawn if the queen has to go and do other duties like defending b2 or defending d4 it's a very easy thing to play again this is in um, a gotham chess course which is what got me into the opening in the first place does it teach you everything no but does it teach you all the basics yeah it's very good and i like i i like uh, making these kinds of videos because whether you have the course or not Either way, I think it's really important to have someone explain to you more of the key ideas of the opening rather than just memorizing moves, right? Because memorization will only get you so far unless you want to memorize everything. But then chess becomes less of a game and more of a science. And then what's the point? So c5, he takes. Completely viable move. We go knight c6, attacking e5, knight f3 and bishop to g4. Now, the RID is here, say white plays a move like a3, which is one of the best moves. You can't take this. It looks like you can, 
because the knight is pinned to the queen. And if bishop b5 check is played, you just drop the knight back. Yeah, it doesn't work because white can just take. And this is what I was saying before. You can get yourself into a lot of trouble in some of these lines uh, because the king is really weak on the light squares because your knight has left the vicinity and your bishop has left the vicinity. Those are the two pieces that helped control the diagonal. And if you try and then take the queen, then bishop b5 check. Your king has no moves. Your knight is gone. Your bishop is gone. So you have to play queen d7, bishop d7, king to d8. And white can just do something simple like this. Go up a ton of material. I mean, what what is he up? A rook? He might lose this knight. But he's going to be up a clean exchange. And obviously, white is completely winning in this position. So you have to be a bit careful about that. Now, our opponent plays bishop b5 immediately. Oh, and don't get me wrong, I have fallen for that before. Like, everyone's fallen for that, so don't worry if you've done it. Because it's a, you know, kind of a something your brain just doesn't really think about sometimes. Because it's like, oh, the knight's pinned, the knight can't move. But it can. You might consider... Sorry, I know I'm rambling a bit here, but you might consider this line and go, oh, it doesn't matter that the uh, diagonal's weak because I can just move my knight back. Yeah, but this move often just skips your brain because you're like, the knight can't move because the knight's pinned. Anyway, you get the idea. Be careful about the diagonal before you play e6 because if e6 is on the board, let's just say for the sake of argument, you have something like this. Then you can sometimes play knight to e5, because if knight takes bishop here, bishop here, you can play king to e7, and you don't have to use the queen to defend the diagonal. Apparently taking here is still bad. Normally you're supposed to try and take on c5 first, because the argument is that white can build up quite a scary looking attack on the queen side if the pawn on c5 still exists. And I have lost games like that. Uh, or get got in bad positions anyway when the pawns just start absolutely rolling. Ran over, ran over. <laughs> be careful of this diagonal. Bishop e5, we can't do this anyway. Queen a5 check is a move here. Knight c3 is the only move to defend the bishop, and then we can go e6. To be fair, I might, I should have probably played this because we have a lot of pressure in this position. It looks kind of difficult for white to properly defend this. Whoops. Like, then you get knight coming to e7 to f5, which is a common idea to put pressure on this bishop, uh, which is trying to defend the c5 pawn, even if the bishop moves to d5, which is also a common idea. Worth bearing in mind. We also have, like, kind of threats. Let's say white plays a move like rook b1. We can take on c5, but we may also have ideas of uh, d4 at some point in the future. Something like, oh, you can't play this yet because the knight hangs. But for the sake of argument, you can get a position like this, where this doesn't work. And the knight is pinned, and the pawn attacks the knight. Right? Or, to avoid this, white might have to take here with the g-pawn, which is what I was on about earlier. You can sometimes force white to ruin his structure on the king's side. And if you can transfer your queen over, you get quite a nice attack in a lot of cases. So, all that to say, <laughs> I hope you are finding uh, my little tangents useful. Because you will probably encounter some of these ideas if you do play this opening. We go e6, and h3 is played. And h3 is a mistake, and that just didn't look right. Because like I was saying, I'm going to take him at some point anyway h3 kind of just like gives me an extra move because I'm going to take him. b4 is one of the main moves which is very common. The knight can't take because the knight's pinned. a5, c3 and the whole point is to try and build this pawn chain to defend the pawn. A lot of the time there's like tactics with um, moves like b6 obviously not in this position but with like takes and then bishop takes b4 with check and then winning b6 with the queen like this and then black gets a nice position not in this one particular but like i said it's a theme to watch out for where b6 can be used to force the opponent to take and then bishop takes b4 comes with a check or not or you can just take on b4 and say yeah you can't defend b6 i'm going to win the pawn with compensation through queenside play 
And also this central structure is quite nice for the black pieces to get a very aggressive looking D pawn in the future. So h3 is a weird move. And of course you take. If you retreat the bishop, then probably g4, bishop g6. It's still equal, but now black, sorry, white can go for this whole plan of b4. Knight to d4 might be coming to put more pressure on the knight. It's just comfortable. Your bishop isn't doing a whole lot. It's far better to take. Because you go, okay, yeah, I've got great control of the light squares. Your knight is doing a great job controlling the dark squares, and I care about the dark squares. I want my pieces to dominate the dark squares, because my pawns already control the light squares. I want to attack your dark squared pawns in the center, and your knight is defending those dark squares. So let's snap it off. Get rid of one of my defenders of the light squares, because I already own the light squares, so I don't care. You know what I mean? So queen f3, and we take on c5. Queen a5 check is always a move in, okay, not always, but often a move in these positions when the bishop is on b5 because it forces knight c3 to block the check and defend the bishop, and then you can go with these bishop takes c5 lines. Personally, though, I like to keep it a little bit more flexible by giving my queen the option of coming to c7 to attack the pawns like this, but that's just personal preference, right? We go bishop c5, and here my opponent goes knight c3, and that is a mistake. Now, typically the knight doesn't belong on c3 in these structures. Normally a pawn goes on c3 to control these dark squares. Because like I said, we just took your knight off the board that was controlling the dark squares. So you need to try and contest them a bit better. Yeah, you're pinning my knight, which is also controlling the dark squares, but my queen is also going to come out onto these dark squared um squares <laughs> um and my knight is going to go from e7 to f5 in a lot of cases to also attack the dark squares or to g6 or to replace the other knight on f6 sorry c6 if you try and take me or if my knight ventures into your position like it did in the game so queen f3 we go bishop c5 and it's tough for white here. He should be playing c3, like I said, but he goes knight c3, which is a mistake because you're contesting the light squares, but you can't. You can't do that. Your knight has no future, you know, because I dominate the light squares. You need to try and maneuver more like this to get onto the dark squares or like this to help defend the dark squares, right? Or develop, well, you should be developing your bishop first, really. I think bishop e3 and c3 are the ideas, or taking uh, the knight to force me to take with the pawn rather than allowing knight e7 so I can take with the knight, and again, pressure the dark squares. And I mean, I'm a bit better, probably because this pawn is weak, your queen side can become, could become weak via the b file, development is very easy for me, but you're not lost as white. Knight e3 though, looks natural, but knight e7. And again, if you now take, it's not as good. I can take with the b-pawn and then put the knight on f5. But personally, I don't like taking with the b-pawn in many cases. I prefer keeping the c-file open for my rook and my queen, potentially. But I also like taking with the knight because I feel like these are some very juicy dark squares to try and take advantage of in the white position. But he castles. He castles. And funnily... Bishop d4 is quite a good move here, which I didn't consider. I don't see what the point is after bishop f4. Okay, these... Okay, bishop, bishop d4 is odd. It's just odd, because normally you want to keep your bishop at a distance so it can snipe. It looks a bit, like, vulnerable on the d4 square, but apparently not. Anyway, castle... And rookie one. Again, rookie one is a weird move. I expected him to take me. And then knight takes. And then he can continue with moves like bishop f4, defending the pawn. You're going to have to reroute this knight because, like I said, it's doing nothing of any use here. But okay, I'm going to play moves like rook c8, maybe queen b6. Again, you've got to watch out for queen, uh, knight a4 forking the queen and bishop, but that's the same in so many openings. But he doesn't take me, he goes rookie one. 
And like I said, this allows the move knight to d4. Knight g6 here is a move. But I feel like knight d4 is very forceful. Because, like I said, I considered this move. But I didn't like ideas like bishop d3. I know this pawn is hanging, this variation. Oh, it's actually difficult to defend. Because bishop f4, knight d4, and the queen is getting very overloaded with all the work she has to do. So, okay, knight g6 is a good move. I liked knight d4, though, because I wanted to snap this bishop off. And here I was expecting queen to d3, just to try and hold everything together, like this. And yeah, queen b6 I was calculating, but I didn't like it because of bishop to e3, which was a pretty good evaluation. I do have knight ef5 here, but then knight a4... Queen b5, queen b5, knight b5, bishop c5, rook fc8. I guess I win the c2 pawn. This should be pretty winning for black, to be fair. But after queen d3, a6 is a bit better. Because the bishop now can't retreat back home. So if bishop to a4, we can just continue with knight g6, apparently. It's difficult to kick our knight out. Also difficult to kick our bishop out. And we just have a lot of pressure on the white position. But the game goes on. We can also go to f5. But I was a bit worried about g4 moves. Because normally you want to have a pawn on h5. If you're going to play knight to f5. Which is very reminiscent of some French ideas as well. You could go for a position like this. And have a very comfortable game. I mean you're playing the black pieces. You're like what? 15 moves in. And you have a positional domination. He's got a horrible, horrible bishop just looking at a complete wedge in the center. Never going to get into the game. This happened in um, a previous Karikon game in the speedrun. When again I got incredibly high accuracy. The bishop was just locked out of the game because of this pawn chain. It's so difficult to actually like, use your light squared bishop effectively if I have this massive, like, really strong pawn chain in the center. So he goes queen to h5. And like I say, I could have taken this knight. Sorry, the bishop. Oh, there is this line. That's... No, not that. That's very nice. And then you win the knight. Something like bishop e3. Take the knight. You're up a clean pawn. Knight f5 is coming. Maybe knight g6. Your queen's active. His bishop's not doing very much. That's a nice line. Didn't see that. If I'd have seen it, would I have gone for it though? Because the thing is, queen h5, like it's just it just allows this. It just allows this. I mean, both of these are the critical moves, but I decided knight c2 was the best. It was a little bit scary, but I was like, the only way you can justify this is with bishop d3. That's the only way you can justify that move. But it just 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 just, just eh, g6, g6. And it's the only move to keep hold of the advantage. But it's also kind of an obvious move. Because you attack the queen. You block the diagonal off. So you can't take the knight. Because I'll take your queen. Right? And here I, um, I did say. Queen d1 might be the best move. Just to go look. Okay. You win the exchange. Fair play. But people don't play like that. That's like admitting you're wrong. And I think white genuinely thought. He, hadn't, he had a good attack here. It was kind of scary. You know, bishop g5. I have to be careful. The initial... What was the initial line I was looking at? I think this was the line I was looking at initially. Uh, oh, no. Initially, I was looking at queen d7. Because if bishop f6, I was thinking knight f5. But the bishop just controls that square. So you just snap it off and then I'm getting mated. So it's not simple... Right, it's not simple to defend this, but yeah, the problem is just knight d3. I had a feeling this attack just didn't work for him, and knight d3, yeah. And the problem is, if he goes bishop to f6 now, whoops, not that, then knight f5, and your queen's under attack, and I defend g7. And if you take my queen, I take your queen. And I'm up again, a rook, a knight, and a pawn. 
So what? The only safe square for the queen is d2. And I can just keep it nice and simple and just move my queen. Yeah, you can win this, but I'm up so much material as it is. Queen b6 is more accurate, apparently. If uh, knight to a4, then you can take here. Oh, and I think you just come in with... Um, queen e3 is probably the simplest. Just defending everything. Basically forcing a tread of queens. So otherwise, I'm coming in with mating ideas. And again, you're up, what? Two pawns, a rook, and a knight. Like, it's game over. You don't need to mate your opponent if you can win an absolute butt-ton of material. So g4 is the best move, and it makes sense because you're stopping the knight from coming to f5, right? Knight takes e5 is a move here. And I did consider this, because if I can get this move in, then I win the bishop by force. But I wasn't sure what I did after bishop to f6. Oh, knight f5. That's nice. Yeah, you can't really take, because I just take on f6 and the bishop is undefended. And again, if you take my queen, then I take your queen, and I'm still up two pawns, a knight, and a rook. Way more than enough material. So that's a nice line. And like I said, I did consider that, but I don't think I... Well, no, I know I didn't see this move, which is nice. But there was a simpler way to go about this with f6, in my opinion. This is also a move, because if you go for this, then this comes with a discover check, and I win the queen. You don't have enough time to mate me. But I wasn't sure what I did after king g2, and yet apparently the same ideas of f6 and f5 apply in this position. I just mixed the move order. Not mixed it up in a bad way, I just changed the move order around, just to keep it a bit simpler for me. Because I was like, why open the f file with no reason? Yeah, like that could just be asking for trouble. I know the computer says it doesn't, but I'm not a computer. I'm also low on time. So I thought it was far better to go f6. And bishop takes f6. Originally I was calculating rook f6, pawn f6, and queen to f8. And if we go for all of this, I end up up a piece. I'm completely winning because f2 is going to fall. If you try and play the move uh, rook to f1, I can also just play rook f8. And you're really struggling to defend this. If you go knight d1 to try and defend, then this looks abysmal. Like, <clears throat> your pieces are completely stuck probably going to march this pawn down the board and force the lines open against you but I'm just up a clean piece so it's game over like I said I could have gone for that but I thought why complicate it and I'll go rook f7 instead um, it is a little bit better to have taken with the pawn apparently again rook f7 was my idea and I was happy to give this up because I was going to play bishop takes e7 again not not the most accurate but the simplest. I offer you a trade. If you try and decline the trade, well, I have d4 actually forking. So if bishop e7, bishop d2, f2 just hangs, and my king is completely safe here. Like my rook monitors everything. I now have fantastic control of the dart squares with my bishop and my queen linking up. And again, I'm still just up a rook and a pawn. So this is game over. If I could just teleport this rook to f8 instantly, game done. This knight was out of the game the whole game because it was just stuck behind my pawn wall in the center. Worth noting. Power of the Cairo Khan, ladies and gentlemen. Anyway, he took with the bishop. Like I said, I was considering taking... Sorry, my game froze for a second there. After bishop takes, I was considering taking, but rook f7 was far, far easier, in my opinion. My opponent chose h4, which is, I mean, it makes sense, right? You're just trying to force open the king side. If I play a stupid move like a6, don't get me wrong, I'm still winning in this position, but white's asking a few more questions. If I do something silly like taking, maybe this is scary. Computer says I'm good, because like I say, I, ju I just run to e8, and this pawn wall keeps my king nice and safe. But why why allow complications for no reason? I instead just take on f2. If you um, try and save your queen with a move like, I don't know, queen here. I actually just fork it anyway. I don't think you can put your queen on a square where I can't fork it, actually, which is quite funny. 
either way, g4 falls, uh, or you lose even more. So he went king g2, I take on g4 anyway, with a fork. Queen g5, we take on f6. White's biggest attacker, his dark squared bishop, is now gone. Takes with a pawn, knight f5, we threaten f6, you can't defend that. He goes h5, we take. Queen moves, and yeah, here we have mating 6 with knight to e3. And the queen hangs, of course we can take the queen, and he's still getting mated. But I just thought this was a bit of an easier checkmating pattern to realise, because the king can't move. We control all of its squares that it can go to. So all we have to do is force the queen away from the defence. The king can choose either square, and on either square gets mated. Like so. And that's the game. And we are now 19 elo points away from potentially the end of the series. If you stuck around till the end, let me know if you want me to do like another one of these rating climb series, like starting again from, I don't know, like a thousand elo or something and building back up and basically just doing the same thing. Or if you'd like to see something different. And if you would like to see something different, let me know what, please. I'm all ears. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.